So I guess we might as well get going. I'll start with the very first thing, Panoptes. Does anybody know what it stands for? <laughs> we, we barely know ourselves. It stands for the uh, um, Panoptic Astronomical Networked Optical Observatory for Translating Exoplanets Survey, which oddly enough uh, does not have a letter for the word observatory, which is probably one of the most important words in the title, but that's okay. <laughs> So um, before we dig into the science, let's tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, you can hear me on this mic. I'm Wilfred Gee. Um, I was at the University of Hawaii doing an undergraduate degree, another undergraduate degree, and got involved with this project. Um, I am just switching in about a month. I'm going down to Macquarie University in Australia to do my PhD, working on Project Panoptes the whole time. Um, and I'm also just a web applications developer, wear a pearl hat in my other day job, so. Yep, and I'm Jen, um, Jen Tong. I'm a developer advocate at Google by day, where I do silly things with code using Google Cloud Platform and then um, convince Google to keep paying me to do it. And Panoptes is one of those things, which has been a lot of fun. For which we have been exceptionally grateful. <laughs> Yay. So now that you know a little bit about us. Let me ask all of you some questions. Why not? So first of all, how many of you know what an exoplanet is? I see a few hands, a good number of you. So this one's a little bit harder. Do any of you know what a light curve is in reference to exoplanets? Ah, a couple of people, okay. How many of you are educators? Nobody, one, one, cool. Half, a half. Are any of you amateur astronomers? Awesome. And then one last one, which is hopefully for all of you. How many of you think space is neat? Yeah, yeah space is pretty neat. Okay, well, thank you. That, that enlightened us and will help us tune the content for the rest of our talk. The rest of our talk about these four things. Um, we're going to start by talking about exoplanets, giving you some background information. Then we're going to go into our project goals, the goals of Panoptes. And then explain what Panoptes is, like the anatomy of Panoptes as a project, the software, you know, the bits and the bolts that make it up, and then kind of give you a status check on where we are right now. So without further ado, boop, exoplanets. All right, thank you. So I knew, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about exoplanets to a lot of groups, high school groups, college groups, et cetera, and I knew we were on the, the final hour of the final day and everyone's kind of tired here, maybe. So I thought I would try something a little different. So we are going to do the history of exoplanets and their detection in verse. So bear with me. And I have it, don't have it memorized, but we'll see what we can do. So this is called Project Panoptes, of course, by Wilfred Tyler Gee. A long time ago, in the 80s, let's say, in a star system located far, far away, from the galactic center, but it was home to the Earth where there lived a vain little species, the center of the universe. Now, these humans would stare looking up from the ground, but despite their best efforts, no others they found. A wandering star, a local planet, yes, they did see, but alone in the universe they assumed they must be. Other stars? Sure. There were a billion above, and astronomers to categorize them, that's something they love. But when they looked at the stars, what did they see? Certainly not a planet around a celestial body. However, some were determined and kept looking for more, but it's not like a planet just knocks at your door. Then in 95, Mayor and Quiroz caused shock by revealing that planets, instead of knocking, could rock. Not rock out loud, nor of the terrestrial kind, but rock the star in its orbit, a remarkable find. A find so exciting you'll have to excuse while I pause very briefly, to take our first interlude. Now, 51 Pegasi has a planet called B that tugs at its parent star. Now, Newton has told us of the gravity that holds us and how it pulls everything from afar. Take a two-body system where one's huge and one isn't, for instance, the sun and the earth. Here, the sun holds its ground while the planet goes round for its entire orbital girth. However, as the planet goes round, a slight wobble is found from the planet pulling its way. Take 51 Pegasi and its hot Jupiter named B that orbits in just four rapid days. For when the planet goes far to the other, other side of the star, 
the light is red shifted away. And by shifting this light even ever so slight, planets start to show up in a periodic way. Now, Doppler spectroscopy, another name for radial velocity, is the name of this detection technique. And as far as techniques go, RV stole the show and finally gave us some planets to seek. But now back on the Earth, this caused quite a stir, for astronomers had never considered these planets before. A Jupiter mass at 0.05 AU? Why, that's closer than Mercury, which I'm sure that you knew. You see, we did have some models of how planets form, but the first one we found was way out of the norm. Gas giants, we thought, should be far from their star and should never be able to migrate that far. Now, their results at the time could not be explained, but more importantly, it caused their approach to be changed. For if we knew what there was one, then surely there's others just waiting out there for someone to discover. And discover they did, but with all new techniques, for some of the astronomers had started to think. If a planet that big passes so close to its source, it would naturally interfere with the light beam, of course. So it was Charbonneau et al., some researchers from Harvard, who really got this whole exoplanet detection thing started. And the transit technique is the one that they used, which brings us, of course, to our next interlude. It's just luck you might say, that a planet falls in the way to catch in our line of sight. But although this is true, what I'd like to tell you is that the numbers make it turn out all right. If just 1% are coplanar, then it's a no-brainer that we can get a significant amount. For 1% of a billion is still 10 million, and that's a conservative count. But how does it happen, this magical dampening of something so large and so bright? Oops, of something so large and so bright? Well, by keeping tight count of the photon amount that comes at us all through the night, we can see a slight dimming, not the same as a shimmering, but an actual reduction in flux. This corresponds to a planet in the midst of a transit and doesn't rely on luck. Now, it takes just 1% of the total light sent for us to measure a light curve. So by keeping close track of the light in the black, all that's left to do is observe. So, transits were successful and proved possible to find, causing NASA and others to make up their mind to commission a scope, one sent up in space, that really began to heat up this race. Kepler's its name, and it had just one purpose, to stare at the sky and report it back to us. At one spot, it looked, with an unwavering eye, capturing everything that happened in that small chunk of sky. For three years, it looked, and the data's still coming. But in that short time, it found way more than a dozen. First 20, then 50, and finally 100. And astronomers were stoked that it had even gotten funded. And now here we are a few years later. The numbers are high, and they keep getting greater. In fact, this very month, 1,200 more were announced, more than doubling the number of the confirmed planet count. So the science is great, and the research exciting. And if you want to get involved, it seems super inviting. But there's just one problem with these giant surveys. You need a PhD 12 years and millions of dollars you can pay. But wait, wait, that can't be all. Surely I didn't come here just to put up a wall. And while PhDs and giant missions are great, that's no way to get the public to relate. And if there's one thing we've learned from all this open source, it's that everyday people want in on discourse. So we're happy to say, you can help find exoplanets in full force. How do you do it? Project Panoptes, of course. Thank you. So, thank you, thank you. We'll go more. <laughs> so, following that's kind of hard, but <laughs> I will do my best with a little bit about our project goals. Let me pass my mic. So, um, some of this was in the, the previous verse, but uh, Panopti's goals, um, we want to find exoplanets. So one of our primary first goals is research. Um, we want to find exoplanets, and we want to assist scientists to do anything they can with the data that comes from Panopti's, because you can look for other things in space, too. But one thing that makes Panopti's a little bit different is we have a, a second primary goal, just as important to us as education and outreach. Because exoplanets are cool, but what's even cooler is all of you getting involved, everyone out there um, being able to uh, actually contribute to this process and help make that real research happen. 
And openness is another one of our you know, primary goals. Um, we think open source and open science are really neat, and we think they're important to kind of the success of this project and this science in general. So we want to make sure that all the data, all the source code, all of the hardware designs we create are open and available to everyone who wants to do participate in Panoptes or wants to do something else with it that they think is cool too. Which kind of leads us right into our approach. The goals definitely influence our approach on that. So and rather than go out and build one giant ground-based telescope or a space-based telescope, Panoptes focuses on harnessing the power of a whole lot of tiny telescopes all over the world. And it turns out this gives us some significant advantages. Um, we end up with a whole lot of samples. Like, sure, they're lower quality, but it turns out that makes it easier to do certain kinds of science with it. Um, particularly, it allows us to look in different places um, for planets than previous surveys have done. And this uh, also allowed us to, to really make outreach one of the kind of things that guided our design. Boop. So, um, come over here. Yeah. So, so the big one, you know, Project Panoptes is a citizen science open source project. The idea is we are targeting high school groups, college groups, and interested amateurs. So what we want to do is we have a kit. It's a single SKU kit, and a school can... The idea is they fundraise $5,000, which we feel is entirely appropriate for what you get out of this. Um, and that kit will come to them, and then they spend a semester building this kit and have lesson plans related to that kit. And NASA JPL right now is helping us develop those lesson plans, those kind of things. Um, but sort of the whole efficacy of Panoptes stems from the fact that we use only commercial products. So inside there are just Canon Rebels. They're over the counter, they're $300 for the body. Um, there's two of them in there. But it turns out that you, and we'll go a little bit in a bit, in just a minute into why that's usually bad for science and how we overcome that. But basically what happens is each individual unit for us is $5,000. That's our target goal. It'll never be more than $5,000. Compared, of course, to the huge costs of, mission like, of missions like Kepler, which was 550, or LSST, which is the next big generation survey, which is going to watch the entire night sky every three days. So it'll visit every part of the night sky every three days, um, located down in Chile, and it's coming online in 2022 or 2023. But it actually turns out, if you look at the economics of this and take those little detectors and we start co-adding the data, in a, what's called étendu, which is how they measure survey performance, Project Panoptes is more cost-effective than all of these missions. If we build enough of these units to match what Kepler can see, to have the same optical efficiency as Kepler, sure, it's a lot of money, but ours comes out to about 1.5 million. It's something like 15,000 units that you have to do, and it's $1.5 million. And instead of scientists and NASA building it and no one working on it, it's high school students all over the world who build all of those things and start collecting the data. So for us, it's a very cost-effective approach. It solves a whole bunch of battles all at once, and it gets people actually involved in science, because while people get excited about Kepler, not really very many people can use Kepler all that much. Um, but more importantly, you know, Kepler stared at one tiny small section of sky, and it stared at it for a long time. There's a couple of other missions coming online soon. TESS is a satellite, and it's going to cover most of the night sky, or some of the night sky. But pretty much in that big yellow circle in the top, your top left over there, that's where Kepler looked. That's where, of the 2,000-some-odd confirmed planets, 90% of them are located. The rest of them are located in these few other yellow spots. But the rest of the night sky, we know nothing about. And that's because these missions are so big and expensive that they can't spend their time looking around for different places. And big telescopes like Keck or Subaru, they can't go looking for planets, they have to know where they are because they're so expensive to operate. So what Panoptes is, the reason Panoptes is nice, is we start building these, we can start covering all sections of sky, we can have units in Africa and South America, and we can have redundant units in case the weather's bad. So the goal for Panoptes is literally 24-7 coverage of the entire night sky. Um, that's sort of what we're aiming for, to fill in the rest of that map um, for everyone else. So, how it works? So, we have big goals, big aspirations. Let's talk a little bit about how we're actually going to accomplish those. So, actually, wait, did you want to cover these? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do yeah. Sorry, I meant to keep going. I'll let so, the astronomer cover more yeah, astronomy. 
I, so I'm the astronomer. I also wrote, I, you know, I do Python. I wrote most of the control system software for this that's all out there. Um, and then I'm doing astronomy on the side. So this is an example of an image we take. This is 100% illuminated moon. So this is like terrible, terrible conditions usually. Um, there's still, probably not on that resolution, but there's about 30,000 stars in there. In one of our normal shots, we have about 100,000 stars that we're monitoring at the same time. Um, we're looking at that, for instance, we're looking at one tiny little pixel. We look at all of them, obviously. That happens to be WASP-35b. That's one of the known transiting exoplanets um, that we were just following up on. Um, so we just watch those tiny little pixels, and essentially we're just watching for a 1% level change in that pixel. So if normally we would have 16,000 photons that come in, and suddenly that drops down to one, you know, less than 1% of that, 15,000 some odd, that's what we register as an exoplanet detection. Um, but the problem is, like I said, we're using Canon Rebels. And Canon Rebels, like your cell phone camera and like all cameras that we normal humans use, have what's called a Bayer array. Um, astronomers don't like color. Like every pretty picture you see is heavily processed and it's not what an astronomer ever works with. Um, because essentially, color is filtering, it's blocking photons, and astronomers want as many photons as they can. So on big telescopes, they move a big red filter, and they watch in the red, and then they move a big green filter, that kind of thing. So the Bayer array, that's one pixel each. In your 18 megapixel camera, what that really means is you have nine million green pixels, four and a half million blue pixels and four and a half million red pixels. That's what your 18 meg means. And you can see they're laid out like that and it's green because that's what our eyes correspond to. Terrible, terrible, terrible stuff for science. Bad news. Because essentially you don't know what you're getting. You don't know the photon counts the same. Um, so, and here's an example you can see that. The problem is a star can cross over on those different pixels. So basically it could be halfway on a red pixel and halfway on a green pixel. You'll get different photon counts for that. And you can see as it moves, this is one star moving up, you know, we're going to get sort of different readings across different pixels depending on the quantum efficiency of an individual pixel and all those kind of things that are working. So our goal is to lock that down. We keep the stars wherever they start. We have sub-pixel tracing, so, you know, we don't get this drift across. And we keep it locked on wherever it started. And if it started on a green pixel, it's going to end on a green pixel. And essentially what we do is compare it to all the other stars that are on green pixels. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but this isn't about the algorithm, so I'll leave it at that. But just know that, you know, normally the problem with these cameras is you can't do science on them. And that's why you don't see it happening out there a lot. And that's what we are overcoming. And that's what makes this very efficient. So... Um, for instance, here's what your normal reading would be like. There's frame numbers, there's relative flux. Flux is just how much light's coming. You can see like the red and the green and the blue channels are all bouncing around crazy. This is how a normal camera would work. Um, with the algorithm we've developed, like essentially you minimize how much that wanders around and then anything that's a transit will eventually wander way outside of that. So part of it is just overcoming this barrier with, with commercial cameras. Um, which leads us to how the structure is set up. So now I'm going to talk about the, the actual bits and the bolts that make up Panoptes and allow us to do this. Here's our system diagram. It's very important. We have our wonderful uh, rendering of Panoptes. Um, Panoptes contains some system software. And a lot of Panoptes uh, actually lives up in the cloud, um, running on Google Cloud Platform right now. So first, let's dive into the hardware. Panoptes is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, designed to be built entirely with commercial off-the-shelf components, which is a lot different than a lot of other like research astronomy instruments. And you can see some of the stuff out there. You actually notice we have two cameras on here. Um, does anyone have any ideas why we have two cameras? Stereoscopic? That's, that's the first thing a lot of people think, that we're trying to do stereoscopic or 3D. Um, it actually turns out uh, that any uh, more cameras are generally better, and two cameras kind of gets, gets us to the sweet spot on general like surface area of lens and kind of number of pixels in the sensors to just the, the weight of the camera. And that's actually one of the hard things, keeping that heavy camera stable while it looks at the sky. Um, so it's, it's really just about having more surface area of lens and, and sensor. So we have two cameras in there, but you could, you could build one with four or one um, if there was a reason to. 
um, but our reference unit uses too. Anyway, commercial off-the-shelf components and tools that you could like go buy at Home Depot. Um, then pretty easy construction. You cut some holes and drill things together. Um, this, we actually hope that uh, like a, a high school class could put this together in the course of a semester. Uh, and you know, an amateur with, with more time in their garage might be able to do a little more, a little faster. Um, and you can see as it goes together, it still fits in a box for easy transport. Small enough to fit in your trunk, so when you take it out to observe observation land, you can do your, uh, up, you know, you can get it in a single car and get it up there. And then the complete panoptes um, sitting there on your on your left side. Um, you can see the the top is where, where the cameras live, and then it's hooked up to a mount on a pier. And then there's uh, a lot of com uh, the, most of the operating um, the, the computer that controls it lives in this other um, Pelican box in the back. And it turns out this worked out very 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 well. Um, because if you notice, there's, there's no dome or other components protecting Panoptes from the environment. And in fact, uh, it worked well enough, even without this, that um, you can see it playing in the snow on the other side, and it, it emerged from that snowstorm just fine and continued to observe for, for many, many cycles. Um, so that was one of the big things that allowed it to be as cost-effective as it is, that it's just sitting out there exposed to the elements, which is cool. So diving into the next thing from that three-part diagram before, the system software, the software that's running in that little Pelican box. So it's running, uh, we have a little tiny like PC called an Intel NUC um, that runs, it's running Ubuntu inside that Pelican box, which means we have actually have a lot of power on the Panoptes units themselves to do pre-processing and planning and all that kind of stuff. We also get the full power of an operating system, which is pretty cool. Um, so what we do is we wire that up to some Arduinos, and we use that to do like um, um, weather monitoring and um, you know manage the the point the camera in the right direction. On that we have a bunch of Python three code that does that that communicates with those Arduinos and does all the image capture and stuff. And we've designed the software in such a way that um, somebody who who comes to it who's like a young developer or you know not a professional software engineer will be able to get in there and be able to hack around with the software. Um, and be able to change the way their Panoptes unit behaves if they would like to, um, without having to learn all the details of all you know, the, the sophisticated algorithms and stuff. We kind of hide that behind so that they can, they can play around. One of our design plans for that. And um, as it turns out, like, uh, Panoptes, like, a lot of the code ends up kind of running along a state machine, which I will take you through now. A night in the life of Panoptes. So Panoptes is kind of like a cat or a vampire or something in that it sleeps during the day and comes out at night. So as the sun sets, Panoptes will finish its rest. It will come online and enter ready mode and prepare to look at the sky. Then it will go to the internal schedule and decide what objects it wants to look at, which one it wants to look at first, at which point the mount's going to come online and slew. It's going to move over towards that object that it wants to observe first. It'll point at it so it can look at it, and then it will track it. So what this, this means is the mount's going to start moving, um, and it's going to track the movements of the Earth underneath the telescope so it stays pointed at the same object the whole time it's observing. Once it's done observing that object, it'll do a little bit of analysis. It might do some pre-processing, extract some of those little postage stamp size frames, and then go look for the next thing to observe, which it'll slew over to, point at, track as the Earth moves, um, do, you know, do more observation, collect more data, and analyze. And then when it's done for the night, it'll go, it'll, it'll park, um, it'll move into parking mode, which means it's moving back into a safe mode, so that if weather happens or something like that, um, it just chills out, it parks for the night, and then it uh, checks in with the cloud, does its housekeeping tasks, um, which includes uploading all of that content up to the internet, so we can do our fun processing on it. Which brings us to the back end the internet part. I was going to call this slide Cloudware, but I thought that would be too campy. Anyway, uh, the back end. The back end has some goals, too. So as I mentioned earlier, it runs on Google Cloud Platform, um, which is primarily because I get to share resources with projects I think are cool. Um, but as I built, as, as we're kind of designing the back end, one of our primary goals is project flexibility. We want to make sure that if at any time it makes more sense for Panoptes to run anywhere else, so they can get up and move quickly. And um, open source has made that really easy, which is great. Um, we also want to make sure that it is open at every level. So scientists can come in and see the raw data or the process data and do exoplanet research or other kinds of science um, if they want to. And we also want to make sure that any discoveries we make through this process are super easy for people to reproduce. Because reproducible science is best science. 
And through this, we have a few different kinds of data we end up working with. We have the full frame images, which are just like, you know, the raw images right off the camera. We keep all of those, of course. We have those little tiny postage stamps that we actually do our science against. And there are fewer of these, uh, or rather, there are many, many of these, but they're much smaller. So um, like on that really high quality full frame image, we might have like 100,000 different um, objects that we want to track or we want to look at. Um, and that, that's a lot of postage stamps that could come out of, you know, many, many nights of observing the whole sky from many different places. So we're going to have a whole lot of those. And then we also have kind of like a mix of metadata and other supporting data, um, like all the sensors on the Panoptes units that tells us things like the weather conditions and like, you know, voltage levels on the camera, um, which are not like the direct, it's kind of like metadata because it's not like the direct scientific images, but it's important information to know about the conditions that you, you took those images in, for example. So the first part of the kind of the full pipeline that we've gotten working um, is the sensor data. So we have Panathi's units sitting out there, hanging out, doing their science. And um, what happens is every, every uh, morning during that check-in, they're going to take a big ball of JSON data, push it up into Google Cloud Storage, you know, just kind of a big bucket of bits, at which point we have some virtual machines sitting there that fire up and run some Python code and push it on over into um, BigQuery, which is very similar to Apache Drill, so that we can look at all the telemetry on the dashboard. And this is kind of the first end-to-end -end thing we've gotten working. And I'm compelled to show you at least one demo, because we're at OzCon. So I'm going to show you our little dashboard, so we can monitor our, our Panoptes units, our, in our case, the one Panoptes unit that's online right now. Um, so what happens is the data goes up, it, gets, it goes into a uh, big old BigQuery for doing big SQL queries, although we don't have much data up there yet, and we can check in on the first fact that we started checking day to day, which is wind conditions, because wind is cool. Um, we already learned a little bit, um, like that it gets really, really windy up on top of the mountain, uh, as fast as 118 kilometers per hour sometimes in gusts. So not directly um, science relatable, but kind of cool to see all the, all, all the same. So as, as more needs build out, we'll have more of those kind of dashboards so we can track the telescopes as they check in every morning and see how their science gathering went. Then the rest of the pipeline is still kind of planned and in work. Uh, so the Panoptes units um, have a lot of that image data. So what's going to happen with that is we're going to push it up into cloud storage. Um, we're going to go through like cloud data flow, which is kind of our managed Apache beam do all our processing on it, extract all those cool image things, and then push it up into some kind of big NoSQL database. I'm probably going to be using Bigtable. Um, we'll find out, um, which is similar to Apache HBase. Yay, open source. And then once we get that really big index of all of those little post stamps and we want to do our science, um, probably going to keep it simple and just run some Python scripts against it. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see how, how the computation actually looks after we're, we've been doing this for a while. It might move to something else. And then out comes the science. And then we all celebrate, because science. Right? <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to pass it back over for a project status. Yeah. Oh. Still that from you. Um, yeah. And I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm going to cover just a few other quick things that maybe we didn't emphasize is, you know, the, the power of Panoptes relies on this, the network um, in terms of things like even when we went over the state machine, things like the scheduling, because the whole, all the, the idea is that all the units are scheduled together such that we can attain that 24-7 coverage of the night sky. That's what we want to aim for, such that we could all look at the same target or we can make sure we're all looking at different targets. Um, you know, we also talk about Panoptes as a platform for science discovery. Um, we want people, and this is why we made the decisions with Python 3 and being open in every aspect is, you know, we want people to take this and do whatever they want with. It. Um, you know, a teacher, an educator could get this, build it in their classroom, um, and then never contribute exoplanet data. They could use it for whatever they want, and we would be stoked. Great. You know, they, they built this unit. They learned a lot of stuff. They used our materials. Peachy. You know, we're happy for it. What we more so want to see, you know, we were no company. It basically was a bunch of astronomers, one who started it in his garage. Um, we're exoplanet people. But what we would really love to see is someone like, who's interested in near earth objects or space debris or satellite tracking or con you know even supernova reaction we have a really powerful way to react to supernovas such that you know there's a detection alert network out there in the world such that if a supernova is detected they send it out and LSST's goal the one i said that's coming on in 2023 
Their goal is to announce a new supernova within 60 seconds of discovery and then tell the whole world of that. And the idea is that everyone that's listening, with supernovas it's super, super, super important that you get it within the first 24 hours. You want those initial things of light. But the problem is you tell Keck, like, oh, there's a supernova and, well, they're busy that night, or it's bad weather in the one place that it happens to be dark. So it's really hard for global astronomers to track these kind of things. With something like Panoptes, you potentially can just react to that immediately. Um, you also have educators that could use it for whatever other purpose they want. So, but, so where are we with this? Um, you know, we had, like I said, it was, um, Olivier Guillon, who's out at Subaru Telescope, the, he put this in his garage, he built it. Um, he's a MacArthur genius, and he's like literally, my boss is a genius, it's awesome. Um, and he used a lot of his MacArthur funds to start this. Uh, duct tape and like super glue, I mean it was like this ugly, horrible, horrible beast uh, that did what it needed to do, uh, like geniuses do. Um, so then, you know, once he created all that chaos, he brought in other people, and essentially what we've done is formalized the whole thing so that it could be reproduced very easily. From hardware, the, all the software thing, you know, his was terrible, like a 15,000 line C program that no one but him can understand. So, you know, taking all of that and making it really accessible to people, making the instructions accessible. So we've had six years of observing through a couple of different units. Um, you know, this is out on Mauna Loa, I'm in Hawaii, so some of these are out on Mauna Loa in a pretty good condition. Um, then we brought this first baseline unit. This is the one that can be very easily reproduced and comes in the kit, and that's the one that's running every night out there. And then what we did is we were like, oh, we, you know, we don't want to be inundated because we all have day jobs and it's not this. Um, you know, so we're trying to build up the network and we told people, you know, don't build a unit yet, we're not quite ready, we're not quite ready. Now we are happy to say that we're quite ready and that's sort of the process we're at. Um, we've been awarded a NASA JPL grant uh, for the next five years, so we're working with JPL and they're gonna start identifying schools and working with us to develop that. Um, I'm gonna be setting up a number in Australia. Um, so our team is growing, you know, we're, we're getting big. We're certainly not a major company, you know, we, it's not rock solid proof, but it's amateurs trying to find exoplanets and doing that via education and outreach. Um, so, you know, our, our hardware, the, the, the idea is everything should be able to change in the future. So, you know, we don't want to lock things in necessarily. Um, but essentially, yeah, we're, we're, at the, we're at the time to science right now. So we're looking, you know, essentially for people to get involved at this point, um, which is how we contribute. Um, do you want to, I can go. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, yes. Yeah. So if you are eager to contribute, if we convinced you that this is awesome use of your time, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you want to come, write some code. We have a lot of code to write. Actually make that science happen. We love pull requests. Um, as it, as, it, as uh, Wilford mentioned, we want to kind of build a community of people to help support this. This includes people to understand uh, the science and like the, the, the building so they can mentor groups of students and other organizations that want to build a Panatis unit. Or, you know, if you just want to be greedy with your science, you can build your own unit um, and share with us, please. <laughs> And, you know, I know a lot of you work for companies and stuff. It would be really cool if you sponsored a unit at your local education institution. Wouldn't that be cool? But yes. And so just, oops, let me come over here. You know, sort of, sort of, not in summary, but one other point is to say, like, our, our emphasis is dual education and outreach and the science. Like, those are the things that we think are important. And like I was saying, a part of the network is what builds it up and makes that important. You know, and people often are like, oh, I want to build one of these in my backyard, and then I want to find 10 exoplanets. Can I do that? Um, and it, it's kind of a little thing. Like, I don't know how many people know, like, the Keck telescopes out in Hawaii. It's some of the biggest telescope. It's the biggest telescope in the world right now. And its mirror is 10 meters wide, but it's actually 36 individual mirror segments. Um, the 30-meter telescope, which they want to bring online in about a decade, is like 110 individual mirror segments. Wait, thank you. Yes, excellent. Um, a Panoptes unit is like an individual mirror segment. Uh, so the scientific value of one individual unit is not actually that high. The scientific value of all of the units networked is incredibly high. The education and outreach potential of one individual unit 
is incredibly high. And that's how we justify it. You know, one unit is never going to find 10 million exoplanets. It's never going to match Kepler. It's never going to do anything. But one unit that a classroom spends a semester building. They have teams wiring Arduinos. They have teams working with the nooks. They have people doing assembly. We had high school interns this summer who were operating the drill presses. So the educational and outreach value of this, the getting people involved with science, the, the saying that, hey, science, like legitimate science can happen open source is what we're going for. You know, things like uh, Galaxy Zoo or all the Zooniverse, the Planet Hunters, you, while they're great and we totally support them, you know, most of those citizen science projects, you're essentially using the end user as a classifier. That's all you're doing. You know, you're basically training your machine learning database by using humans. That's what they're trying to do. And people enjoy that, but people don't have a part in the data collection process. You know, they're trying to involve them more with the science now, but people aren't actually that involved with the science. This approach is a lot more hands-on. It's a lot more direct. It's a enormous education and potential value. You know, we want to do things like um, generate, a, I would love to generate IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, excuse me, that are teaching people how to program Python, but instead of writing a, you know, dumb conditional or some dumb for loop that does nothing, you're actually legitimately moving your robot around or taking pictures of the night sky in some pre-planned lesson that's not going to blow the robot up or something like that. So you, like, really get people involved with working on it and feel that they can contribute. And that, that's our goal, is that education and outreach um, real emphasis on that, and that's what we want people to take away, that, hey, this is cool, this is, you know, we're trying to sort of change how science can be done and really bring it to the people so that people can contribute. So, so yeah, you know, we've got a few sponsors and people that we'd like to thank, you know, they're right there, thank you. Um, and I, I do want to also mention, you know, from my Panoptes perspective, uh, like, we were super fortunate for Google, thank you, Google, um, but like we say of openness, we want to make sure we don't have vendor lock-in. We want to make sure, you know, that was important to us that in the future we could make sure this data is available to people. And all of our partners and everyone who hears about it and all the astronomy conferences we go to agree. And astronomy is sort of moving towards this open data access. Uh, right now in astronomy, you, there's, data is usually firewalled for at least six months to a, up to a year or something while someone wants to publish their own results. So if you observe on Keck, that data is not made public till after the researcher has published whatever they want to publish or some timeout period. Um, with us, we want to throw the data out. You know, we want it out there and available for everyone. So, so thank you all. Um, there's a fun little movie of, this was, that's the duct tapey one uh, that he built in his garage, uh, just playing and kind of shows you the course of a night how it goes. So. Uh, at this time, we'd like to take any questions, if people have them, please ask away. I'd, we'd love to hear from you. So, uh, I think there's a microphone, if you guys, I don't, I, they are filming it, so if you want to go up to the mic. Hey, great, great, great project. Thanks. Um, I'm curious about ambient light and like how you manage for different kinds of conditions. Like if you're looking for a 1% change, mm -hmm. like how do you, I mean, are you just not putting these guys in cities or? Yeah, and that, yeah, great question. And so the question is, you know, how do we handle, you know, a unit in downtown LA? Um, the secret sauce to the whole Panopis project, like I said, is that all of the data is networked together. So while a unit in downtown LA, like we're putting one at JPL right now, it won't get very good data. But all of that data, those postage stamps that Jen talked about, the data from that unit is added to the data from the Mauna Loa unit, and it's coordinated with the targets, and it's added over time. So our data will continually and always get better the more data we have. And even insignificant contributions to that just start trickling and adding up. So like, whether it's your best idea to put it in downtown LA, probably not, who knows. Um, what we've actually been doing is working with people. The idea would be, and this is where we said we want like mentors and people, is you would build it like in your school, in your class, et cetera, and then find a better location and operate it remotely. Oh, and one other thing I said, so we have the whole state machine that's running around doing its own thing. At any time, the people who built that unit, there's a local web page running, they can absolutely control it. They can throw things into the scheduler. They can say, I want to take a pretty picture of the moon. And they always have absolute control of their unit. If they're not manually using it, 
that's when it falls back to exoplanet detection. So they could potentially use it for some other things, but yeah, I mean, bright cities aren't the best, of course, but if you have 5,000 of them in bright cities, that data still contributes to us, so, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, that was the most awesome talk in this conference, um, at least for me. <laughs> and um, uh, my question is, do you calibrate does software calibrate individual cameras to the reference light curves? Yeah, so I was like, how much should I go into the actual processing at this? You know, you know I'm usually at astronomy conferences. Um, I, I now I will actually be, SPIE is the big optics, astron or it's optics, it's not astronomy. Uh, it's the big optics conference in the world. It's in Scotland in about a month and a half. Um, so we will be publishing our sort of the algorithm there um, and then that's, some of the other things I'm doing on my PhD. Um, but it's actually, it's interesting. So we have a slightly different algorithm and it's all out on the website. You can go up there and read about it. Um, it's basically a comparison with the other stars. I'll give you, what are we at time? I'll give you a real quick and dirty. Basically we take 10,000, you know, there's 100,000 stars up there. In between, like when Jen was showing you that process between observing and then analyzing and then tracking, we, have, we give ourselves 10 seconds in there and that's why we need the Intel NOC. In those 10 seconds, we need to plate solve the image, figure out where we were, and then adjust the mount and then keep moving. Um, after that, what we do for the processing is we take the 100,000 stars, we generate a point spread function. This is what astronomers use to measure like the sharpness of a light, like so if it's, Take a point, spread it out. You want it not so spread out. So you know, you want like a tightness or a non-tightness. Basically we generate PSFs for all 100,000 stars in there and then we categorize those PSFs into similar looking shapes and then we watch those shapes as groups. So you know, I generate 100 stars that have this exact PSF shape and we watch that for the next three hours and that corresponds to these 100 stars. Those stars should all change together so if a cloud comes by, they'll all dim together. If whatever happens, they'll all dim together. If there's a transit, one of them will go down in relative to the other. So it's all relative photometry. If for the new astronomers out there, it's not absolute photometry. It's relative to the image. And that's how we get over systematic errors in the CCD and in the cameras. That's how we get over weather condition errors. And really, we actually beat it down to the photon noise level. Um, and all those papers are out there. And so you can see of the research. But yeah, we do get it down to the photon level, so. But if you're interested, please, yeah, go check it out or talk to me after about it, so. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, as far as helping out the code, mm -hmm. what would you say is the very first thing somebody should do? Okay, so the question was in, in terms of helping out with code, what should you do? Um, we, you know, we have a couple of different ideas. Like, we're operational right now in terms of the movement of the unit, the individual units, so it's out there collecting data. And sort of the next phase is shoving that all up into the Google Cloud. So there's different things depending on what people want to do. I mean, if people still want, uh, there's still obviously work to be done on individual units. We always want to improve that. For instance, we use a commercial weather thing right now. It costs us $500. You could build it for 60 bucks. Like, you could easily build it. And what we will ideally want to do is a high school group to build that, write up the instructions, update our manual, and now our price is no longer 5000 it's $4,500. So there's just different areas depending on what you're interested in. Um, you know, like, I, what we did right before this is sort of populated some of our GitHub issues and different things. But, like, if you're interested in social media, for instance, like, we eventually want your Panoptes unit. They all have cute little names. So, like, you know, eventually, oh, in fact, click. Um, uh, they all have cute little names and like, so we want social media that ties those together. We want a school to be able to go in and say, here's the data we've contributed or here's some of our images or we took these pretty images or share. So there's that component. There's still more hardware components. Um, we're actually, the hardware, when it said we're version 1.0 roughly, we're trying to refine our electronics. Um, to add some current monitoring and some power switches and stuff like that. So if you're into Arduinos, hardware, that kind of stuff, we have work to do. So, so really there's, there's a lot out there, so. Yeah, I think so. There's a couple of different repositories. So there's like an, uh, the, obs the, the observer, excuse me, 
the observatory control system, there's the environmental repository, there's uh, the local intranet page that the unit uses to control the unit, which I need a lot of help with, right? And actually, that's a Meteor application, just because I wanted to play with Meteor. So, like, you know, the, you know, like we need stuff like that, just depending, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, that was some great words. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I missed this, maybe you answered this in the previous response, but how exactly do you localize each Panoptus unit? You said something about taking a reference image and figuring out where it is. Is there GPS in there? Yeah, localize. Well, well, the reference image was actual data. Like when we're going for a light curve, we take the first couple of frames like you want to start. And that, so that's what I was talking about with the local reference but just, image. Just in the state machine where you have a schedule and it yeah. slews and pans and takes a picture of a portion of the sky. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that where the Panoptus unit is geographically located affects... Yeah, um, I, and I, you know, we actually haven't even mentioned AstroPi. I'm sorry, I'm totally remiss in that. AstroPi is the sort of our bolts and what makes this possible. AstroPi is really powerful and out there. So we have a basic configuration system, um, and there's actually a affiliated AstroPi project called AstroPlan, which needs a lot of work done on it. It's not affiliated with us, but we use it. Um, and like there's some Google Summer of Code people working on it. And AstroPlan does all of that. It takes your location, which you enter in, because most of them aren't you working. The, the units actually have a GPS on it, but we just assume they plug it in. So that handles all the where is your exact position, what time of the day it is, where should the stars be, all of that kind of thing, um, which is important. But actually, you know, once a unit is up and running, um, Obviously, if you wanted to take a picture of like a Messier object, it's very important you show, know exactly where it is. For us, we actually, our pointing is not that important because we want to control the whole sky. So eventually, once we lock an image, the only important thing for us is that the next ones have the subpixel tracking. So our pointing is not actually that important. We can be off by... I mean, hell, we don't even have to have the target in the image. What we're eventually going to do with the scheduling is just have reference frames, not individual targets. So, you know, it, it does handle it. I mean, our pointing is, is uh, we go to 0 0.01 degree, like we solve it to within 0 0.01 degree, and then subpixel tracks that. So, Thanks. But AstroPy certainly is the way to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Please do get involved or go hit our webpage or even tell someone else you know. There's another question coming up. One last question, yes, well, sir. although I have a bunch. Okay, I'll, you I'll, can talk to me after. And I'll blame it on you. Yeah, uh, my question uh, has nothing to do with the astronomy part of it. Okay. Um, uh, no. I work in meteorology, <laughs> so the question I have is, uh, what kind of weather instrumentation are you using and was is it in the plans to put the weather data online Mm -hmm. and to check that against local weather conditions. Yeah, so we use, an, it's called an AAG Cloud Watcher. Uh, it's a great little product. Uh, it's like 400 bucks. It's got an anemometer an or whatever they're called, uh, a wind thing. Um, you know, and it's serial. You plug it in, you get values out of it. Um, like I said, and, and that's, we, because we don't have that dome, we do rely on that pretty heavily. We have other temperature sensors and humidity sensors that are going on all throughout it as well. Um, but mostly we rely on that, that commercial weather product. That is one of the things we want to replace. I mean, we're totally happy with that product, but it does have that cost. And it really would be dead simple for a group to build your own little weather unit for a lot cheaper and sort of formalize that. Because we're so pressed for manpower and time, that was one of our decisions where we just bought the product and that's what we've worked with. Um, the only thing to building your own would be making sure the data gets in the same format. Um, we don't tie into local weather right now or any local weather station, but it would be interesting. One of the things we do want to do with the cloud and with the data is make this available for all people. So actually going back to the question about the ambient light, and this is kind of the same as the weather, is you know I can easily see people using this like, hey, here's all this weather data or light data. Let's monitor light pollution levels all across the planet. Like we've got essentially light pollution monitoring levels. So that's actually why I think it would be cool in cities. And same with the weather. Like essentially you're throwing out a bunch of weather stations all over the, the globe too. Um, so yeah, you know, we just use something. If you have ideas, please contact us and we would love the help to get something custom and even better. So thanks.
<laughs> we, we could take photos in the day and track smog. It's true. You could, you know, uh, not many people have talked about daytime uses. You're in charge of that subcommittee. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> um, any other questions? Thank you again. Thank you for tolerating the poetry. I appreciate that. <laughs>